Welcome to my presentation. I'm Elisa Bellotti from the Mitchell Center for Social Network Analysis at the University of Manchester. Today I'm going to talk about how to mix, mix, how to mix methods in social network analysis. In the paper that I submitted for this session, I also talk about um, the ontological and epistemological foundations of mixed methods and of whole network analysis. But for this presentation, I'm just going to concentrate on how to apply mixed methods in EgoNet. So the outline of my presentation is um, we're going to talk about what is social network analysis, the goals of social network analysis or what we're trying to achieve when we apply this perspective, why mix methods in social networks, and then I'm going to go through four empirical examples on how to mix methods in Econet research, and then we're going to conclude. So what is social network analysis? Peter Carrington says that social network analysis is fundamentally neither qualitative nor quantitative, nor a combination of the two, but it's rather structural. What it means is that it departs from the logic of statistics of the more, the more likely, and it uses graph theory, um, a mathematics perspective, that doesn't represent quantitative, but structures, as in patterns that emerge from interweaving ties. So these patterns are systemic in the sense that we cannot observe a portion of the network to infer the structure of the rest. And they're also highly contextual, which means that network characteristics are not generalizable to other networks. So when we do social network analysis, usually we aim to explore or explain two different aspects. On one hand, we develop theories of networks, which look at the mechanisms of network formation and evolution, and therefore we look at mechanisms like reciprocity, transitivity, balance, preferential, preferential attachment, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, we might look to develop network theories that explore and explain network outcomes, how a specific position in a network might that results in an increase or decrease of social capital or social support. And these two aspects of networks are interdependent with, between each other because the position you occupy in a network might um, generate social capital and an increase in social capital might attract more relationships, therefore changing your position in the network. But why do we want to mix uh, methods in social network analysis? So, Usually the me mechanisms that we identify across networks, for example, transitivity, clusterability, might be the outcome of very different processes, might assume very different meanings, and might imply very different consequences. So when we apply qualitative methods, we, actually, we can complement the measurements of network structures, and we can contextualize these structures and grasp the significance of the processes, the positions, and the outcomes for the people who are embedded in the network. On the other hand, when we use quantitative methods applied to social network analysis, as in classic statistical modeling, we can complement qualitative finding and move beyond the limited generalizability of qualitative approach. So when we mix method in EgoNets, we can do it for, with the aim of building typologies of modeling structures and outcomes of networks, or to reformulate um, social network theories. So the first example I'm going to use to illustrate these three types of research is the, um, the study of Claire Pidart and colleagues, where they were interested in how different life trajectories, for example, entering the, in the labor market, geographical mobility or formation of a family, impact the size and composition of personal networks of 66 young people in Normandy. They want to explore and explain how networks evolve, and therefore we are within the framework of theory of networks. So what they did was to interview the 66 young adults every three years. They ask some name generators, sociographic characteristic of alters and alter alter tides, which constitute the quantitative data collection. And they also uh, collected in-depth interviews in which individuals were allowed to discuss at length personal and relational changes. So they analyze the quantitative aspects of their data by simply counting the number of ties that each um, personal network had at each time in, the, in which individuals were interviewed, and they could create four different typologies of networks. The networks that increase over time, networks that decrease over time, and then we have networks that increase at the beginning and then decrease, or decrease and then increase. 
So these quantitative typologies, descriptive quantitative typologies, were then illustrated with qualitative interviews in which they found very different patterns of change that brought, um, that generates the same type of uh, structural change. So for example, in the, um, in the category of network that decrease over time, they found that the decrease in the size could be uh, due for both uh, entering into the job market and therefore young people leave the teenage style of sociability that they had at school or at university and reduce the network um, of their friends and contacts to people who were more alike, people who were already in the job market and therefore had less time to spend uh, socializing during the day. Uh, but also they found that the same network decrease was also caused by, the, by people who left school but to enter unemployment or early motherhood. So in this case, people decreased the network size not because they left the sociability, not because they entered into the job market, but because they didn't enter the job market. The, the, the example of Claire Bidart is an example of a very descriptive analysis of networks, but we can move beyond the descriptive and try to model the connector structure, which is what Miranda Lubbers and colleagues do in their studies of the changes of personal networks of Argentinians in Spain, in Catalonia. But well, again, they want to explore and explain how networks evolve over time. So what they did was to interview 25 Argentinians twice. They had a series of questions about themselves, a name generator where they had to mention 45 alters they know, a series of alters attributes and alter alter ties. The outcome in Egonet visualization, of which you have an example in the slide, was then used to conduct a qualitative interview at both times where people could talk about the, the reasons why their network changed. And therefore, um, the researchers could isolate important predictors of this change. And they looked at how th this predictor uh, produced involution, stability, or evolution of networks. Then they convert this qualitative information into numbers and they use this information within uh, a, an, an, a series of statistical models where they combine the qualitative uh, data with the, the network data and the personal data. And they were interested in looking at the, um, the changes within each tie of, the, of this personal network. So they wanted to see if a relationship uh, was formed was maintained or was um, deleted over time in each EgoNet, but also for those relationships that um, change that remained stable over time, they wanted to see if they became closer or uh, more distant. So in order to do so, they apply multi-level logistic and linear regression analysis, where they um, they take into account the fact that ties within an ego net are dependent from this ego. So there is more, uh, there is a higher probability that ties within a, a specific ego net will change similarly to the other ties. And therefore we cannot just, the, the, the observations, the ties are not independent from each other, but they are dependent from the ego. So the multi-level approach allow to condition the changes of the tie depending on the ego to, to which they are attached. Then they also wanted to see if networks and stru uh, structure and composition changed over, over time. So for example, do networks become more centralized? Do they become larger, smaller, more dense, and so on and so forth. And because each of these ego net is independent from all the other 25, they can apply a simple multivalue regression analysis because the, the, the observation, each individual ego net doesn't violate the assumption of independences that we need to apply statistical modeling. And then they, the, uh, in the last model, they wanted to, to, to look at the changes in alter alter ties. And to do so, they use stochastic actor oriented models now, what are the advantages of this um, type of approach is that obviously it gives a much more robust um, results in terms of the changes in the ego nets. It's not just descriptive. We can compare our descriptions against statistical probability that these changes might happen or not. So what they found, for example, is that relationships are more persistent when contacts are frequent. 
and alters are more central in personal networks. But the limits of this analysis is, first of all, that because we only have 25 econets, the statistical power is very limited by the number of cases. So we cannot really generalize much beyond the 25 cases that we collected. But most important is that in, a, in such analysis, we model our hypothesis against the null hypothesis. So we say that we expect people who are more central to be, um, the relationship with people who are more central to be more persistent. And, that, and, and we, we model this against the lack of this correlation between persistency and centrality. But what cannot be said, what cannot be said in such analysis is why other ties are not equally maintained. So to overcome the limits of both statistical power and of the, the limits of what can be uh, said about these models, I'm going to present a second uh, study, which is Bettina Holstein and, and colleagues' study on the changes, uh, the effects of personal networks on the transition to working life. Uh, of young authors in southern Germany. So the method of data collection is quite similar to the one that we've just seen. They interview three, 35 people three times. And these people were selected because they were unemployed at the time of the first interview. They enrolled in an employment assistance program. And at the time of the last interview, they either find or not a job. So the data here were collected by a qualitative interview a questionnaire on pers with personal data, four gener gen name generators that were collected using the concentric circles, which is the picture you've got in the slide, and a series of alter attributes. The type of analysis that they adopt here is very different from the one of Lubbers and colleagues. So here they use qualitative comparative analysis, or QCA, which analyze each case, each personal network as a combination of potential factors that produce a specific outcome. The outcome of interest here is to find or not a job. So what, we, what they're trying to do is to detect causal mechanisms in set of cases without assuming that these causal mechanisms are the same across all the cases that they collected. So I remind you, to, just to remind you, there were 35 individuals. Some of them find jobs, some of them didn't find jobs. So what they try to, to find to develop is a, is a series of set theoretical hypotheses that are constructed with the logic if and then. And what this type of hypothesis allow you to do is to produce asymmetric causation. So the, the people who find the job might not um, have the same combination of factors that every other cases have. So there might be some combination of factors that are more common than others, but in, in this type of analysis, you count of all the possible combinations of factors. And it's not limited by the statistical power because it, we don't observe the variance across cases. So we don't see that the people who find jobs on average have a higher level of education. We see, for example, that um, we find uh, compositions of uh, elements, for example, increase in educational training and volunteering might facilitate in, in finding a job. But in other cases, having an employed mother and being endorsed by a teacher might equally uh, increase the chances of finding a job. And you crea create this um, hypothesis that are constructed on the logic of if and then. So if a person, for example, has not got a criminal conviction, then increasing educational skills or volunteering might facilitate in finding a job. So this type of analysis allows you to um, make hypothesis for both people who find jobs and don't find jobs. And therefore, the mechanisms, the combination of mechanisms that might produce one or the other outcome might be very different. The last type of research that you can do with mixed methods in Econets is allows you to reformulate theories. So in this case, I'm going to use Mario's small uh, study that has been published in the book, Someone to Talk To. And small starts with a very simple question. He asks, whom do we talk to when, wh who do we talk to about matters that are important to us? This is a very classic question in social network analysis that became popular and mainstream with the General Social Service in the US. So Ron Barth used these questions in the General Social Survey to collect what he thinks are strong ties. Now, Ron Barth wasn't interested in finding out who people talk to, but he used the question as a proxy to collect strong ties. 
this became an established theory where the, the, somehow like within 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 time the strong ties became um became the ones that we believe are used when we need to talk to someone but small conducted a previous study on um, women who leave their children to daycare center and they and he noticed that in these cases women were very happy to leave their children with parents that they barely know so they wouldn't trust and talk about their kids what we would consider weak ties so they wouldn't use their strong ties for to entrust them for their, with their kids but they would use what we call the weak ties so he has this um, odd finding, qualitative finding, that somehow challenged the established theory of strong ties. So he went on to challenge the theory and test it again. So he de designed a very small um, tailored qualitative study in which he interviewed 38 grad graduate students who entered a PhD program in a large US institution he subministered to them the same GSS questionnaire that Bart subministered in the, in the US, where he asked them who do they talk to when they had something important to discuss. And then he conducted qualitative interviews where he swapped around the, the question and he asked the students to list the three most impelling concerns, recall when was the last time they talked about them, with whom, why and why didn't they talk about the people that they nominated in the questionnaire before in case they didn't so what came out of this little qualitative study that was developed to test the theory of the general social survey is that uh, nearly half of intimate conversation were with someone who was not named in the questionnaire as a confidant and people um, didn't talk to them because they inten intentionally avoided them or because they were the the people they talked to were more relevant and empathic, empathic, empath, empathic about the the topic they wanted to discuss, or because the people who they eventually talked to were available when they needed to talk. So Small came up with a new set of assumptions that challenged the original theory of strong ties, and with an inductive process, he developed new set of assumptions that says that people might have good reasons to avoid strong ties when they want to talk about something important. For example, they might not want to um, upset a partner. They might not want to worry the pa parents. They, the people might act spontaneously and therefore they don't really plan who they want to talk to, but they just find themselves in situations where um, they share some situations with people and therefore they decide to talk to them and that the foci of social activity might affect who do we confide to. Well, for example, mothers confide with each other just because they see each other more often. So he now has this new theory, but when he went on and asked himself if this theory would hold on a sample of people that goes beyond PhD students. So he designed two online surveys, one that was administered to, to nearly two, no, to over 2,000 adults, where he asked to report their core discussion network and then the people they're close to. So they asked two questions. He asked two questions like, who, do, who are you close to and who do you talk to when you have something important to discuss? And nearly in, in half of the cases, the people named did not match. And then he conducted a second online survey on the reason why people might avoid talking to someone. And in this case, he, he interviewed a sample of 2,211 2, college students. And he found that the primary reason for talking to whom they did was that these people were available at the time. And then in one third of the, of the occasions, the decision wasn't planned. So it's not that they decided they had an issue they wanted to discuss and they consciously decided who do they want to talk to, but they just happened to talk to the people who were available. So in this last example, empirical example, we see how qualitative and quantitative methods can be used in social network analysis to test theory and explore new theories. So he uh, small started with a, uh, a puzzling qualitative finding that people trust weak ties, he then start questioning the theory, so with an induction process, and, um, and ask himself if people trust strong ties. He then decided to test this theory 
in a deductive way, but instead of using a, a quantitative uh, study, which is what you would expect in theory testing, he actually developed an explore, exploratory qualitative study that gave him new um, assumptions to reformulate the theory. So we have another inductive process here that people don't always trust strong ties and why they might avoid them. And then he went again to test these new assumptions um, and see if the qualitative finding would hold in a wider population. So this allows him to test if the theory that he came up with is portable to other contexts. So it allows to explain why people, for example, might not talk about inner struggles, might not come out with their parents, might not report violence, might not disclose secret behaviors. So to conclude, we, we saw that social network analysis is a mathematical perspective that can be fruitfully mixed with qualitative methods as well as quantitative statistical methods. Qualitative method, methods are useful to contextualize the mechanisms, to identify, uh, identify alternative trajectories and to explore subjective perceptions of personal networks. They're also very useful to challenge and test theories of networks or network theory. So for example, the struggle to find a job might uh, result in a reduction in the number of meaningful relationships, but at the same time, the very lack of such relationships might hinder our ability in finding a job. Or we might subjectively believe that in case we need, we turn to our closest relationships, but then in everyday practice, we actually consciously or unconsciously rely on the opportunities that our networks give to us. And then combined with quantitative methods, qualitative approach are useful to model network formations and outcomes and to move beyond the non-generalizability of qualitative data. So this is all from me. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'm looking forward to comments and um, critics in case.